One of the first things we'll need to do is to set up our size. So we can set up a size for the project and set that up. So now when I run it, I have a bigger screen. So we have some space in which to work. Something has now changed this time because if you notice, I went away from using integers and chose instead to use floats so that I have the option of using numbers that are not whole numbers, which for the purposes of this, as we're going to increment things and animate things on screen, it's nice to have finer gradations than whole numbers. So that's why I switched from using int and instead went to float. Another interesting thing happened on the way to the fair is you'll notice these values have not, my variables have not been assigned a value yet. For kicks, we're going to run this and see what happens with not having those values. So I'm going to try and draw a rectangle. And what we'll see is what does processing have to say when I try and run this? And it's not complaining. And if I look really, really close, I'll see there's one little dot right here in the corner. And that one little dot right in the corner happens to be the rectangle that it drew. Processing does something that is arguably good and bad in that if I create a variable and don't assign a value to it, it assumes then the value is 0. So it set x, y width and height to 0, so it drew a rectangle at 0, 0, top left corner, and then it put the one pixel stroke around it, which was that one little pixel dot in the corner of my screen. So if I were to define those values, but only the x and y, now I will see that dot has moved to right here. So it's now drawing that rectangle right there, even though that rectangle has no width and height defined for it yet. So something that I am doing a little bit different in this particular example besides using floats instead of integers is I have created my global variables that I wish to use and just as a reminder I'll just put in a comment and mention that. So those are global variables, but I am giving them values inside my setup. A common programming practice in a lot of languages is you define or reserve space for your variables, but then you give them a value inside a constructor or a function at a later point. So instead of defining the values up here, I'm defining them inside my setup. So now my width and height all have values, and now if I run it, I get the box. Now I have my box drawing itself on screen. It's putting it where it needs to put it. Previously, we animated our object by modifying one of its properties by a number. When I look at that number, that works but we can't do anything else to it because I want, when I get to the edge of the screen, 
I want it to start going back in the other direction. And I can't do that with a hard-coded value. And this is where variables become useful. When we have variables, we're making a reference to something. And this is also going to allow us to then be asking that question of, hey, you know, when if I'm at the edge of the screen, I want to go do something different. So we're going to cover a couple of different concepts here to figure out how to work with it. And the first one is going to be referred to as a conditional. So what I can say is if x is greater than so I want to find out if my x is greater than a certain number. And the number I'm looking for is the edge of my screen. Now I know that the edge of my screen was set in my size statement inside the setup where I said 800. So I could just put in 800. So if that x is greater than 800, now I'm going to have a set of curly braces. Actually, I don't want greater. In this instance, I first want to just start out with less. I'm going to just take this little line of the x plus. And for kicks, I'm going to lower that 800 down to 7. And you'll understand why I did that in a moment. Because if I leave it at 8, well, we'll leave it at 8. But let's speed it up so we don't have to watch it move so slowly. Okay, so as far as we can tell, nothing different happened. But if I change that 8 to a 7, you can see how the box has effectively stopped moving. And now 7 was an important number because the width of my object is 100. The size of my screen is 800 wide, so if I take 100 off of that, that's 700. So that's why the box stopped moving after going 700. If we go 600, we can make it look even more impressive. And we can see how it keeps drawing, skipping 10 pixels at a time until it goes over 600. Looking over the code, we'll see that speedx has yet to receive an initial value. It's just hanging out by itself, feeling left out of the fun. So if I give speedx a value of, let me just go with 5. Now what I can do instead of hard coding in x is equal to x plus 10, I'll just say x is equal to x plus speedx. Now if I run this, I'll see now it moves at 5 and it stops. All right. So that's working. But what would be really fun is if I could somehow get it to start going back the other way. A common thing you have to do when you're solving problems in programming is grind your way through it and try a lot of different iterations until something happens. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to comment this stuff out because I know I'm not going to be using that just yet. And I'll try out a different solution. So currently what we're really looking at is I've been setting x is equal to x and then I'm adding to it speed x. And when I run that, the box wanders its way across the screen and then keeps on going. But what I want to do is modify it. So after the box has hit the edge of the screen, I want it to go back in the other direction. So there's a really fun concept in 
programming, especially for visual programming and animation programming, and it's the concept of negative one and how we can use that to our advantage. So what I'm first going to say is if x is greater than, now if you remember last time, we know that our sketch is 800 wide, the object's 100 wide, so we could type in the number 700. But a better way of doing it would be to type in 800 minus w. Because that way if my object is ever sized differently, this code will still work. Then I put in a curly brace, hit return twice, put in my closing curly brace. It's always a good idea to put in your closing curly brace and then hit the up arrow or click with your mouse to go back into the curly braces so you don't forget that trailing curly brace. Because I guarantee at some point it will come back to haunt you that you forget the curly brace and then you're unhappy when your code is not working. And when we get curlies nested inside of curlies, that will start to become an issue. So now what I can do is say speed x is equal to speed x times negative 1. So we're going to multiply speed x by negative 1. We will be looking at some shorthand ways of writing some of these things that are just a little bit easier to type, possibly easier to read. They're easier to read once you get accustomed to it, but in the beginning it can throw people off. So now our object is going to modify its position by speed x, and then if x is greater than 800, the size of my sketch, minus the width of the object, which is 100, then we will make speed x equal to speed x times minus 1. So speed x started at 5. So at this point, speed x is going to become minus 5. So if I run this, let's see what happens. Oh, close. It bounced, but then it didn't bounce when it got back to the left edge. And I'm going to change my 5 to a 10 so we can watch the example play out a little bit faster. We'll watch it again, and we can see how it bounces and then disappears. Now that I have it, the object is stopping on the side of the screen, what I could do is add in another statement and say if my x is less than 0, because we know that would be the other side of the screen. At that point, hit return twice, closing curly, up arrow once, and that gets you into the right spot. x is equal to speed x times negative 1. So we know 0 is the left, 800 minus w gives us to the right. Now let's see if I get my bounce factor going on, and now we have it bouncing. If I do not want to have the frame still showing and want to just fill the background, so it cleans it each time, I can just use my background statement, run that to now it just looks like the bouncing box moving on the screen. So all is good. So I have two if statements here. And we can write this as it's been written. But we can also look at it as redundant programming that we might want to do things different. And we have another option where instead of saying with two separate ifs, we can say if my x is greater than 800 minus w, else if my x is less than 0, then do something else. So both of these are doing the same thing, so they're that anytime you do the same thing twice, often twice in a row inside of code, that tells you there's probably a better way to do it. And we'll get to it in coming weeks. So if I can write it with uh, if, else, if, or two complete separate if statements. 
So what these are doing here, so to look at it with this else if statement, I don't really, you know, I'm not caring whether speed x is positive or negative or even having to remember it, but the reality of what's going on is that I'm saying speed x is equal to negative 10. And the other one is saying speed x is equal to 10. So that's really what I've done with this minus 1. But now I had to think about, wait, which way do I want it to go? How do I want it to run? And if we run this, we'll see that we still have to balance and it works the same. So a couple of things are important in this concept. There's multiple ways to skin our proverbial cat. I can solve the problem differently. Is one better than the other? Is one more efficient than the other? Does one make more sense than the other? Inside of coding and programming, you will find there are two ways of writing your code. One is super efficient coding. And that may give you better performance, it handles larger data sets, and it can just be better from a technical standpoint. But often, to achieve that, we sacrifice human readability. So if we think about the most efficient code for the computer, so computer readability may not be very readable to a human. And when you're doing coding, especially in the beginning, we're going to err on the side of trying to write human readable code. So the code you write, another person can read through what you've written, and it makes sense. As you write your coding, you're going to progressively realize that as you understand more, you can start writing more efficient code that may not be as readable to a human who has less background in what you're doing, but it's going to be ultimately easier to write and more effective from a performance standpoint. With this, I've hard coded in the value speed x is negative 10, speed x is 10, because that's what's happening. But the reality is, if I don't want to think about it and just know that I want to x velocity or speed to be 10, and then I just want to reverse that when I hit the wall, that is why we use the speed x is equal to speed x times minus 1, because that changes its value. But now I mentally don't have to use any brain power to remember, well, wait, if I'm going this direction, I want it positive. If I know I just want to flip the direction, we use the minus 1. Now, what I can do is, right now the box defaults at starting fill color is white. But when I hit the right side of my screen, I'm going to change my fill color to red. And when I hit the left side of the screen, I'm going to change my fill color to green. And not pretty green, the full maxed out green of RGB, ugly green. So now when I run this, we can see how then the box is flipping between red and green as it's hitting the sides. going to clean the code up just a little bit and get rid of some of the extra things we're not using anymore. It's not a bad practice while you're working. Is just comment things out as you don't use them or refactor or rewrite something, comment it out and leave it there until you're like, okay, now I really know I don't need this anymore. Then you can go through and do, all right, delete, gone. So I know I this line I'm not going to use anymore, this line I'll get rid of, and these down here. So I'm just 
cleaning it up for readability, but leave that stuff in because it doesn't hurt to just comment things out. Comments do not slow your code down. They don't. The only thing they do is either help or hurt readability. All right. So now I have it bouncing. It's changing colors when it gets to the sides of the screen. And it's changing it to a defined color. Now, what we could look through and go, it's like, I want to figure out how to do random. I want to create a random color. Now, if I don't know, okay, what is the syntax? How does processing want to do a random if I don't know? Highlight it. I can go under help and I can choose find in reference. Through the help, I have a bunch of different options for generating random values. Noise, noise seed, random seed but the one we want is random. Now when I look at random, what we'll see is I can specify a random value that I want. I can also specify a lower limit and higher limit for that random number. That's important if I wanted to choose, like say, a random color. I want to choose a random color and want it to be within a certain range, then I can use that to my advantage when I am coding. So, no, we don't need that there, but now so if I say a random red value and a random green value. Now this is going to give me a random range between 0 and 255. So it could be light, could be dark, Seems we're getting this. Oh, there we go. Now we're getting some different values. Now, if I want to narrow down that range, I could say something like 100, 150. So now that's going to give a much narrower range of. my reds and it will be a darker red than it. If we want just a truly random number or random color, we can provide a random value for all of my attributes. So every time it hits, it's going to give me some random color where when it hits the left margin it's giving me variations of green but if I just want random period or in this case I want random yellows so red and green all the way on give you the color yellow if we just leave blue off so now we get could be any getting all kinds of weird options If we take and apply a random fill color so that every frame the box is going to be drawn in a random color, we'll see it's now near seizure inducing as to the color options that it's providing. Don't recommend that because that can be problematic. Now, if we want to make it even more uh, painful to watch, we can do a random color with a random box moving across it and we'll see now both are strobing in a very painful manner. I would discourage that from your projects, but if we were to say grab a narrower range for the background, we'll see it's now by choosing a random range of 200 to 255 on the reds, now the red is shimmery, but it's not as painful to watch. You're going to get a little more variation. 
you can see how the background so you can start to create certain visual effects if you modulate your colors over time and you can use this random range as a possibility of making that happen. Now the next task is to remove some of the painful to look at options that are working on here and instead look at it and go okay I have a speed X what if we have a speed Y as well so our object can move in both an X and Y direction at the same time so it can be moving diagonally so what I want you to do is to add in a speed Y and make it so that your object is now moving and that's going to require you to define speed Y it's going to require you to modify position based on speed Y and to be checking for the top and bottom boundary first thing we need to add in float speed y give speed y a value so looks about the same now if I modify my values y is equal to y plus speed y a uh, common gotcha to look out for is when you have speed x and speed y and you're doing things it's not uncommon you start copy pasting lines of code to save yourself typing strokes and then you forget to change things so you're setting like say x and y both modified by speed y and you get some unpredictable weird results you're like why is it not going and you're like oh whoops my bad so if I run this now we should see at least it uh, moves oh and now it's diagonally moving somewhere else off the screen because I didn't put any stops in for the sides. So what I'm going to do is put in a comment right here and say check, check horizontal boundaries. And now down here I'm going to add in a new set of statements and this will be my check boundaries so if and this would be one where I could do a whole bunch of copy pasting and then just change X's to Y's or I'll just say if Y is greater than height minus H and I am introducing something here that we didn't use before. I'll explain that uh, momentarily. Then speed y time times equals minus one. Again, doing something that I didn't do before because that's the nice person that I am. If y is less than zero, speed y times equals minus one close out my curly brace there and let's run it and see what happens and we can see now it's bouncing and it currently is changing color when it hits the left two boundaries but we have nothing going on for the top and bottom because there's no color statements so a few words about what just happened here and what this extra stuff is going on there are built-in properties in processing if I have set the size of my sketch inside my setup function so I said size is 800 by 600 width and height then instead of hard coding in that value I can just use the word height if I use the word height by itself processing knows I'm saying the size of my sketch the height of my sketch in this case and I could go back and change my 800 to width if I can spell it correctly and it turns pink so that clues me in that this is an understood value so I have that now the next line here my line 46 where I said speed y times equals negative 1 is the equivalent of writing speed y is equal to speed y times negative 1 so these two statements are identical they are shorthand for each other so this first one is a shorter way of writing this so if we're repeating the value 
So if we look at x is equal to x plus speed x, I could also say x plus equals speed x. These two statements do the same thing. So the second one is a shorthand way of writing the first one. If you like that, go for it. If you prefer that x is equal to x plus speed x because that makes more sense, it's more human readable for you right now, then I would encourage you to do that. I will use both as we roll forward. In the beginning, I will be using more of the x is equal to x plus speed x verbiage, but I will be migrating in the coming weeks to using plus equals or minus equals or times equals or divide equals just because that is a convention that when you see other code from other people they will use that as well so I want you to get comfortable with it and used to seeing it so now I have my object bouncing off of all the different boundaries run it again just to verify bounces off all of them and it will keep going forever now if we set our value at a much higher amount you can see we get some really weird things that are starting to happen what's kind of fun in this particular one because the movement is the full size of the object it starts to almost look like the object is continuous due to persistence of vision. So as we have the persistence of image occurring on here and how our eyes are able to adapt, even though it's only drawing one box at any given time, our eyes have not forgotten the previous images yet. So it looks almost like it's showing multiple objects on screen simultaneously, which is kind of fun.